everyone find some good food for lunch? Woo! Cheese steaks, anybody? No, no Philly cheese steaks? Oh, such a shame. Such a shame. Do that for dinner, cheese steaks. Okay, this next block is our case studies, projects and processes block. Before we start up with uh, Kip Bradford over here, um, if you need to go anywhere, use the back doors, please, so we keep these doors closed, not to distract the speakers, okay? Um, and that's it, so Kip Bradford. Afternoon. Did everybody have a great lunch, I hope? Yes. Welcome to Philadelphia. I'm actually from Philadelphia, although I don't live here now. Um, and my name's Kip Bradford. I've been making a lot of stuff for a long time. Can everyone hear? Is that better? Raise your hand in the back if you can hear what I'm saying. Awesome. So I'll try to speak in the microphone. Um, so I... Um, have manufactured a lot of products and I've sent a lot of products to manufacture through other people and I've prototyped a lot of products. I started life as a toy inventor and uh, invented somewhere upwards of 3,000 products where I built full working prototypes. Um, let's see, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. All right, we'll just deal with feedback. So um, I make stuff and I'm a biomechanical engineer the stuff that I make uh, is strange, it's medical frequently, it's industrial, and from that I've gained a lot of lessons, a lot of experience, some nice lessons. Um, yep. yep, I'm gonna do that. And we'll go back to presentation mode. I'm just gonna put my laptop down here. All right, so my presentation notes are on that computer, um, little technical stuff. I'm just gonna ignore the presentation notes, so you're just gonna get a little bit of off-the-cuff stories. Um, <clears throat> in the world of gadgets in America, and, and in the rest of the world too, there's this beautiful vision, this dream, that I'll have an idea, and I'm really passionate about that idea. And because I'm really excited about it, I'm gonna build it and then everybody else is gonna like it and I'm gonna sell a ton and I'm gonna become a millionaire and it's gonna be rainbows and unicorns. Um, but as we see from a lot of situations, that is rarely the case. Um, the lessons that people learn in, in that process can be painful at best, can be legally tragic at worst, and what I want to talk about is what are the steps that you can take? What are the, some core ideas uh, that you can follow if you want to avoid the kind of failures that a lot of projects uh, in the hardware world see and um, avoid the great catastrophes of engineering and manufacturing stuff? And I'm going to start off with my conclusion, which is that great communication solves a ton of problems. Great communication, and I'm not talking about me talking to you, I'm talking about how do I get the idea in my head, out of my head, into a format that can go into your head so that we both understand the same thing. So, this is a talk about communicating better. And my basic philosophy is open source is one of the base drivers of effective communication in hardware manufacturing. So one story I have to tell is about a little project I did for Google where in two weeks I designed, sourced, manufactured, programmed, and deployed 600 wireless environmental sensor motes. Um, it's one thing to build one which I did in my basement with tweezers and uh, a toaster oven, some squeegee for solder paste. You're probably familiar with that process. It's another thing to build 600, where two of the resistors on the circuit board were improperly placed at 90 degrees to the orientation they were supposed to be placed at, despite the fact that I had given very, very specific instructions to the manufacturer. Not only that, I gave them two prototype boards so they could look at that and compare it to what was coming off the production line. Yet, they still made a mistake. 
And that's typical. That's to be expected. What was really nice in this case is that I took that batch of 600 boards where we were assembling them and programming them at Google's headquarters up in Boston. I loaded them into my station wagon. I drove them back down to the manufacturer in Rhode Island. And I sat down with the pick and place operator and said, here's the board that I gave you. Here are the schematics. Here's the bill of materials, et cetera, et cetera. And here's what you made. And with no argument whatsoever, in 15 minutes, he said, I'll fix it. Four hours later, they had removed 1,200 resistors, rotated them 90 degrees, and replaced them on the board. I drove back up to Google, and we continued our all-night run of getting all these things programmed. So 600, it's a small number. It might be big for some of you. But what about 6,000? And what happens when the people who are doing the assembly, the people who are doing the production, are not just down the street, but they're around the world, they're time zones away, they speak a different language. They're completely divorced from the process and the mindset that created the product. They're following someone else's inst instructions. This is what happens. You have good ideas that turn into lawsuits when everything breaks. So my basic tips for success. come down to the open source hardware definition. I think this is a great framework to understand how it is that open source hardware makes manufacturing better. And the key is the modify and make. But I think there's something that I don't know I'd say is necessarily missing in the open source hardware definition, but we want to emphasize. And what I want to emphasize is the preferred format. What does it mean to have a preferred format? What is the preferred format? So I do a lot of my mechanical work with SolidWorks. It is not an open source piece of software. It's an expensive piece of software. But I use it because every single factory I've worked with uses it. So in this context, preferred is the tool that lets me communicate best with my factory. But I also want to communicate with my customers. So I'll take my SolidWorks files and I'll export them into every possible format. If I'm going to open source this, I want people to be able to go to my website and download this in the format of their choice so that they can actually effectively use my products and they can remix my products. So it's one thing to take an Eagle file and put it up on my GitHub site, but I also take all the documentation, all the PDFs, every single way that I can effectively communicate that information. The more open, the more likely I am to avoid mistakes. Eagle is one of the languages that we uh, use to share. That didn't come out at all. But I think the important key here is making everything accessible, making everything accessible in all the different ways that somebody would want that information, sharing it so it's easy to get at. If you bury the information down your website, nobody's going to be able to find it. That's important for manufacturing, but it's also important for your customers. People want to know when something breaks, how to fix it. People want to know how it goes together. So the same sorts of things that make open hardware good, where effectively sharing things with the community means having good documentation, clean files, also will save you from the kinds of problems that manufacturing face. But there are two other nice aspects about making your designs open before you go to manufacturing. One is that stuff that's unmanufacturable will get called out by the community. Inevitably, you'll have somebody, if you've built your product on top of open source uh, development work, then somebody will say, we tried that. It didn't work. Or I know the process that you're going to use, and that's completely unmanufacturable using that process. Another nice thing is you get the design bullshit call out. So when you do something that's just poor design or poorly thought out design, your community will call you and say, hey, you know, that's a really bad idea. That's never going to pan out. Your manufacturers have the transparency to see the thought processes that went into designing your product. And they can call out and say, do you really want it that way? Because we have manufactured a thousand products like yours, and you're an outlier. There has to be a good reason that you've chosen to make your design strange, because we've never seen that before. Why are you doing that? And you might say, oh, 
that was a legitimate error. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. Or you might have a good reason to, and then your manufacturer is not going to second guess you. Um, if this is the wrong audience to ask this question, but um, some of you might fear that, well, if I make my product open, it's going to get ripped off. My counter to that is my last trip to Shenzhen, where um, which of those Apple stores is the real Apple store? <laughs> the answer, none of them. They might all look like the real Apple store. They have people wearing Apple t-shirts in them, all of the products. It looks like an exact like Manhattan Apple store picked up and placed in Shenzhen. But when I went to take a picture of it, security guards came rushing out and practically tackled me. So this is me like running away from the security guards trying to take pictures of the three Apple stores. If the company that has a multi-billion dollar team of lawyers, one of the most aggressively protected patent portfolio in the world, can't keep clones from happening, well, you have no hope in doing that either. So you might as well make things easier on yourself, open source the products that you're manufacturing for the consumer market, um, and share and grow the community and support innovation. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Oops. Hello, my name is Josh Lifton. I'm the co-founder and CEO of CrowdSupply. We're a uh, crowdfunding platform for launching great new manufactured products. We have a heavy emphasis on uh, open source. And I'm gonna talk about two open source projects that we've worked on recently. They're two different laptops. Um, one of them's available now, the other is started shipping earlier this summer, but the bulk of it will be available, I think, next month. One of them is the Novena laptop by uh, Bunny Huang and Sean Cross. Uh, many of you have heard of it, it seems like. Um, and the other is the Librem line of laptops by a company called Purism, which is headed by Todd Weaver. Uh, I was the campaign manager for both of these crowdfunding campaigns on crowd supply, and I wanted to share some insights into how uh, these two very different pieces of hardware approach open source in fairly different ways and what happened. So the Novena is very much geared toward the electrical engineer, hardware hacker, who has a bench probably in their basement uh, with an oscilloscope on it. And this might take the place of the oscilloscope or augment it. Um, it's really meant to be taken apart. You can buy all the components separately, uh, plus a whole bunch of extra ones. The, one of the special pieces is, of course, the main board, which has not only an ARM processor, but an FPGA on it um, integrated into the board. And so you can do all sorts of interesting things like gene sequencing or uh, software-defined radio, um, oscilloscope. All these things are, have either been done or are in the works. Uh, Bunny and, and Zobs, they chose all the components on the, on the motherboard to be as open as possible, which means the tool chains were open source. You didn't need to sign an NDA to understand how every chip on the board worked. Um, and this, of course, necessarily limited them, but it really proved the point that you can make great things even with those constraints, and people should really be making more of these things. Uh, all of the other components were custom made as well. The, the injection molding for the case, uh, the, the Battery packs were sourced uh, to specification, uh, as were the, the, the screens. Uh, so the, whole, the entire supply chain is, is, is still existent. Uh, it still exists, and you can go out and build one of these or modify it yourself. There's a desktop version, just the regular board, a laptop version, and of course, a, an heirloom version. Um, one of the things that they, they included was, was a, a Myriad RF software-defined radio uh, daughter card for early backers and, and a couple of other goodies that you could only get as stretch goals from the campaign. And that kind of explains why the, um, the funding 
nearly or over half of the funding for the project came in the last 20 or 48 hours of the campaign, of a 46 day campaign. And they just did a great job of, of kind of planning that out. And uh, once people realized they would get all this free hardware, they jumped on board. The other computer uh, is the Librem 15 laptop. And really there's three laptops. One of them just got funded a couple days ago, the Librem 13, which is the smaller uh, cousin of the 15. The 15 is, is very different. Um, it's a very different story. The, the hardware itself is not open source. Uh, rather, it was made from uh, re a reference design. The motherboard was made from a reference design. The case was sourced from a manufacturer who was already making, already making the case, and all the other components were sourced as well. What makes it open source, so to speak, is that it was chosen chip by chip so that it only needed free and open source software to run at full capacity. Um, no external blobs from the uh, kernel level up. There is, of course, one blob in the BIOS. It's an Intel chip. Uh, they're working to free that, and they're working very hard at that, but uh, that, that is a, a, a significant hurdle that, that remains. They're trying to open source the reference design. Um, they're working with the, the manufacturer from which it came to, to do that. Um, in the meantime, they're offering it as a sort of out of the box, as free as you can get with, with uh, this level of, of um, processor and, and specs, uh, barring, of course, the bias. Now, the interesting thing about that campaign was when it started, there were eight different configurations. There were two uh, different options for memory, I think a four gigabyte and an eight gigabyte RAM slot. And there were four different storage options. We could have an SSD and a couple of varieties of, of uh, hard drive. By the end of the campaign, uh, and what, what you can buy now, is there are nearly 30,000 different configurations, um, uh, which of course includes th 31 different keyboards. Uh, and all of this came from feedback from the community. Um, people's reaction at first, they were really interested, uh, but they said oh, it wouldn't be great to have a, a full HD or a ultra HD screen or a Croatian keyboard or what, what have you. And Purism and, his, and Talat and his team, they really responded to that and they actually redesigned the entire uh, motherboard as a result. The case remained the same, um, but the motherboard changed significantly. So these three laptops, the Novena and then the two Librams, they've raised collectively uh, well over one and a half million dollars, um, all being sold with the basic premise that they're open source. So there's definitely something there. And this kind of leads to my, my thesis, which is um, that something is happening in consumer electronics, right? And these, the, the things that, that are happening are somewhat unique. Uh, there's a bunch of other projects that we're working on besides these laptops, and they, they all fill this interesting niche. Um, you wouldn't really see them elsewhere. You wouldn't see them in a Target or a Best Buy or an Amazon. And the thesis is that open source plus crowdfunding equals something that couldn't have happened otherwise. Um, that there's no other route for making these devices. There isn't the market, there isn't the venture capital uh, motivation. It's really something that, that can only happen by, by this combination. Um, and that's what we're really interested in pursuing at, at CrowdSupply. And I think that this will lead the way to making them possible in other ways. But the, the first initial instances of them will happen through crowdfunding and, and open source. So that's CrowdSupply. Uh, I'd love to talk to anyone who has questions about these two projects or anything else um, afterward. We look forward to uh, uh, looking forward to launching many more things that are unicorns. Thanks. Hi, I'm Judd. Is my slide? Yes, there we go. 
Hi, I'm Jet. I'm really hot mic Sorry about that. I'll lower my voice a bit. Um, I'm here to talk about common object description languages and how we can start on that road. Um, a little information about me. Um, disclaimers, I pay for all this. My company pays for this. I'm not on the take from any hardware or software vendors. Um, I pay for my software because people pay me for my time. I've been working in open source software since the League for Programming Freedom days um, back in the late 80s. And open source software has been a part of my career ever since. I started at NASA Ames, then I tripped over a startup called General Magic, um, ended up at TiVo, and all that time, open source software is how I paid my bills. And as much as we could, we contributed back to open source software. Um, a couple of years ago, I got a degree in uh, tangible interaction design from Carnegie Mellon. And since then, I work in the area of design, creating, and using tools for digital fabrication. This talk I'm giving today is a result of things I learned doing that work. Um, Basically, we have the problem in hardware that we've had in software for a very long time. We just have too many ways for describing objects. And my talk is going to sound like a bit like KIPS and a bit like Octoparts, because we're all sort of saying the thing, same things and just in different ways. We have to take time from work to fix our models. And I'll talk about 4D objects at a design conference. That's a completely different problem. I'm just looking at 2D and 3D. So how do we get here? We got here because, well, vendors and companies have flooded us with commercial and proprietary formats, and there's just too many things to choose from. In the hardware world, especially with laser cutters, we're using graphics formats for fabrication. Somebody sends me a PDF or an AI file and says, laser cut this. And then the last problem is the classic, our product works fine. It's their product that doesn't work. And in putting together this talk, I was actually thinking about how I'm changing my workflow to deal with these uh, issues of object description. So I looked at a week of my work. Um, I worked at customer sites. Uh, I worked at Hack Pittsburgh, where I do charity work for a nonprofit. I use TechShop Pittsburgh, who has a water jet cutter, which is very closed source, but also weighs like 20 tons or something. Um, and I work in my personal studio, where I bill hours and do research and development. And in that week, I worked with multiple versions of DXF. I don't have any AutoCAD software, and I rely on DXF. I work in Rhino 5, Adobe Illustrator, vCarve. I see 3DM files, STL files. I never see any DAE files. But I also spend hours and hours and hours in software packages converting these formats from one to another. Just a really brief example, I make something, I export the DXF to test it on a laser star. I like that cut. Now I have to retranslate that DXF to run Flow, because Flow only accepts DXF R10 and earlier with certain limitations. And I have to build that hour to someone, or two hours to someone, or eat it out of my own pocket. So in that week, I used a lot of machines. Middlemax, Waterjet, LaserStar, Epilogue, ShopBot, uh, Shapeways, which the X1 services their work. And it's just a huge mess. So we've got to go one way or the other. We either need a prescriptive solution or a descriptive solution. Uh, prescriptive, we know prescriptive. IETF, it's why we have the internet. Thanks, you guys did a great job, and girls. You got, all did a great job. IEEE, same thing. Commercial software vendors, we wouldn't have DXF if it wasn't for AutoCAD. Descriptive is where I think the answer is. And as Kip said, as other people have said, we need to tell people what they need to know, including information that's not allowed in a specific format or a schema. You save a DXF and send it to me, that's great. There's other things I need to know about that information. So looking at this, there's really three things we can do. Now, what we do next, and what we do in the future. Now is pretty straightforward. Support metadata. If you're saving a file, fill out all the little bits that say things like units. Units are very important to know. Um, Annotate your diagrams. We've been doing this since mechanical drawing, back before most of us can afford a computer. If you give me a sketch, tell me what you want it made of. And you can put some text in that sketch. You don't have to, like, you know, give me a text file. Maybe you do. That works. Whatever. Um, if you download a Mach 30 model for a uh, jet engine or a device to make a jet engine, I don't know from jet engines. You need to tell me what you want me to make that out of. And you can just put that in the model, and that's great. The next thing to do, and this is where I'm working right now, is coming up with style, a way to have styles for objects. And we have Python and Perl. We have ways to describe objects in software. And if I'm going to make a model in metric and send you an STL file in metric, I can also send you a script that maybe converts that to another format. I can send you a sidecar file for STL that just says, hey, when you get this STL file, could you do this with it or that with it or convert it to this what, you know, format? You can also make bundles if you're going to distribute your stuff online. This is kind of what Kip was talking about. You know, take your, take your STL file, take your text instructions, take your Perl script that converts from qubits to whatever. Put those in a, sorry, put those in a tar bundle. I'm used to speaking without a mic, sorry. Uh, put those in a tar bundle and put that on your website. So when somebody downloads that file, they know what they're getting. Um, there's an STL plus style thing I'm going to skip through here, but the short of it is I'm playing with, like, can we write STL, header files for STL, STL and STLA files that let us more easily import those files and know what the hell we're importing. The next thing to do, um, and this is sort of where the, the talk was headed, um, it, it turns into a three-hour talk if I go into this. Uh, we need to look at containers. Um, we need to look at metadata for humans in a readable format that's a little better than a DXF file. Yeah, you can save DXF in ASCII, but if you ever looked at a DXF file, you'll go mad. 
Um, there's preferred media, media to avoid. What resolution, what precision, what accuracy, what density, what number of units, how do we use this thing? How do I know I made the right thing that you asked me to make? I mean, I design and make things for a living and I want you, the customer, to be happy. If you give me a file to cut, I need to know what cut means. What's etch? What's etching? You want me to rasterize it? Well, how much and where? The last bit is um, something I get into arguments about at a few sites, but if you ask me to make something and it's a dangerous thing or a dangerous process, you should put that, put that in the file. I mean, I don't know how many people come and say, I want a laser etch a moleskin notebook, and I'm like, do you know what hydrochloric acid is? And the answer is usually no. Um, it will eat the glass, it'll eat the machine, and then I'm out several grand for my laser cutter. There's some other paths we can take. Um, McNeil and Rhino, I'm a paying customer, they don't give me money. Um, they've put some of their schemas and lives in open source and they've added Python scripting to their latest Rhino. Um, I don't know if anybody in open source hardware or software uses Colada, but I know people in the game industry who swear by it and I've looked at their website and it looks pretty cool, but it's a little proprietary. And there could be some academic stuff out there that we should try. Um, I haven't found anything yet, but maybe you know about, you know about something. And that's where we come to this. We as a organization as individuals as, you know, I'm a business person, you're a designer, I'm a designer, maybe you're a student, uh, you know, maybe you make open source hardware, thank you, I will buy more of it. Um, but let's all talk. Uh, there's mailing lists we can speak on, we can go to hacker spaces, we can go to tech spaces, we can find their problems and solutions and how they deal with these things. You can also talk to your commercial vendors and ask for new features uh, for your software. If you're an AutoCAD user and you don't like the way to do something, pester them because you give them money. So um, that's the short of it. Uh, if, you really, if you have any interest in this area, you can find me after this. I'm online a lot, um, easy to get a hold of, and we can uh, start working on some of these projects. So thanks for helping. Uh, can everyone hear me back there? Using the mic? Great. All right. Um, so my name is Grace On. Uh, this is Elizabeth Doyle. Uh, we actually have two other teammates, um, but unfortunately they weren't able to make it. Uh, but we're undergraduates from Olin College of Engineering located in Needham, Massachusetts. And today we want to talk to you about an innovation in socket technology that we created. So I'm sure many of you have seen something like this. Um, a high-tech prosthetic, whether it's a myoelectric or a universal use arm, um, this technology is rapidly advancing and it's just really cool. I mean, look at it, right? Um, but there's one problem in this space and it's that it's proprietary. It also is very costly and even though there are low-cost solutions, um, they tend to be more aesthetic than functional. Um, additionally, due the technology is also proprietary and uh, so because of the patents, the advancement is very slow. So this man we worked with for our project, Chris, uh, provided an interesting case study for us of someone who didn't want either the high-tech universal arm or a purely aesthetic one. He was actually born with one arm and so has lived his whole life maintaining the, his one arm status. He had a couple of prosthetics when he was young, but he rejected them quite early as they were not actually enhancing his life. He doesn't want or need what is traditionally called rehabilitation engineering because he isn't looking to cover it up or to have a purely aesthetic prototype. So Chris came to us with a very interesting proposal and he wanted us to create him a specific, activity specific arm. And this wasn't based on any predefined medical need Rather, it was just based on his only, his desire to simply rock climb. And so before Chris can take any prosthetic limb, um, there was one critical issue that we needed to solve, and that's the socket, the interface between flesh and parts. Today's sockets actually have a strapping mechanism to help them stay on and bear the load. Unfortunately, the sockets are uncomfortable and the strapping mechanism is uncomfortable, and neither is designed for fully active use. You can fix this by using surgical implants, but a lot of people don't want to go there, and so they're left with the socket and harness combinations that aren't made to bear high loads, so they're uncomfortable and not made for sustained use. Unfortunately, this provides most users with little functionality. So the socket is what we focus on during our project. 
We wanted to make sure that the socket has a comfortable interface for Chris to use, but functional enough so that he can use it for active wear, for example, for rock climbing. Um, so today, we'll be showing you a short video of our project. Chris is a Boston engineer who was born with one arm. He grew up exposed to different prosthetic technologies, but the arm skin interface of current sockets makes you choose between comfort and functionality. It would get hot, it would swell, and then it would really like just fill up the socket and be so uncomfortable. Like, I would just put like powerful powder on it and like yeah, it sucks. Soft sockets allow the prosthesis to shift, while stable sockets cause pain from poorly distributed pressure. This discourages physical activity, resulting in muscles weakening over time. And as a result, I mean, I didn't use it for anything except for like holding stuff. In order to make prostheses useful tools, socket technology should focus on providing comfortable, functional connections with the body, rather than just looking like a natural limb. To get there, socket research will need to move away from slow, incremental medical research and into the maker movement, where innovative ideas can come through rapid recombination of novel solutions. We've tried attacking this problem by combining technologies from multiple fields. By the end, our team designed a socket and harness combination that lets Chris attach any specialized prosthetic he wants. The first step was exploring potentially useful materials from all kinds of fields. Inexpensive products containing specialized materials helped us to start testing. We found that material selection is crucial to the socket design because while soft materials are inherently more comfortable, they do have a tendency to slip on the skin, causing much more discomfort in the long run. Using the popular Kinect hardware, a software program called Skinect can create a 3D model of any object. For under $150, we were able to get an accurate digital model of Chris's arm. Additionally, we used a cheap plaster and gauze wrap to create a physical mold of his arm to help with prototyping. Chris mentioned early on that clamping style sockets appealed to him as they utilized the strength of the bone without requiring surgery. We measured comfortable clamping depths of his arm. With these dimensions, we explored various available fabrication techniques. Starting with sketch models made out of everyday materials like cardboard, we then went through five iterations of our actual socket, continually evolving based on Chris's feedback. Chris mentioned that he'd rather have a sturdy and reliable socket than a purely aesthetic one. It needs strong attachment points to both the arm tool and the harness. A spandex shirt served as a simple base upon which we sewed both elastic and rigid straps to provide a strong yet flexible harness for active wear. The elastic straps provide constant tension to keep the socket in place, and the rigid straps are backup supports for cases of extreme load. To keep the design modular, the harness straps attach with quick-release buckles to the socket, and leg straps can be attached for overhead loading. Chris was a great sport and an inspiration, allowing us to try ideas that sounded strange or looked weird. He encouraged the use of new tools and experimental methods for the sake of rapid iteration and quick development, as well as bringing in knowledge from all sorts of other fields. We briefly considered many unexplored routes, ending with a design that brings prosthetic sockets out of proprietary research and into the democratized hacker space. We've got a solution. Can you make a better one? So, as you may imagine, we learned a few things during this project that we'd like to share with you. First, as was mentioned in the video, exploring other fields for ideas and materials was critical to the design. For us, this included looking at sports bracing and athletic clothing, among other fields. Next was Chris expressed to us a desire near the beginning 
to have a socket that was reliable and low tech. He didn't want something that had cool gadgets in it but was going to break. He wanted the thing that worked and was simple. So he asked us and we said, okay, this sounds, this sounds like a good thing. We want it to work. And so we made sure to use everyday materials in it because Chris is an engineer. And so we wanted him to be able to fix and alter anything that we made because he's going to take this. He's going to make other arms that go on it. He's going to be working with it. So that was important. Um, by taking this low-tech mindset, low mindset, we also reinforce in our own minds that while high-tech is really fun to learn and kind of cool, it's not for everyone or every situation. Interestingly, designing for one forced a price constraint that promoted affordability rather than affordability being an afterthought. While we were designing one socket specifically for Chris, we made certain to use processes that were generalizable so that anyone else can take our work, build on it, and make sockets for others. So working with Chris really gave us first-hand knowledge in this space of disability. Even though our, our ideas were crazy, unique, challenging, um, it just showed that it requires that kind of mindset to work in this space. And so we want to invite all of you to discover for yourself um, unique and challenging problems within this space because we believe that disability concerns are everyone's concerns. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing? All right, that's what I like to hear. It's almost 3.30, so we're all going to be finishing out this session together. I know it's the afternoon. I know it's hot and sweaty. Don't worry, we're going to have some fun. So first thing what I want you to do, everybody, reach up and stretch. And with your hand, reach into your bag and grab this little uh, cardboard box that everyone gave you in your nice Open Hardware Summit goodie bag. Inside, you will find a nice little piece of electronics. No, I didn't make it. Yes, I'm going to use it. Open source. <laughs> Reach in and grab out this little orange device. There's a little power switch on off. I'll let you find that while I say a couple of words. First of all, thank you to Open Hardware for happening here in Philadelphia this year. All right, yeah, round of applause. I'm sure many of you know last year it was in Rome. And here in Philadelphia, we're in the habit of importing things from Rome, especially this week. I'm much more excited about today. Don't tell anybody. All right, so I am Bevan Weissman. I am with New American Public Art. We make large, interactive, artistic installations, often involving a lot of open source technology, often generating a lot of open source solutions. So one thing that excites me about open hardware, by now you probably have this guy booted up, turned on. If it's not, there might be a little uh, plastic circle covering the battery. Try taking that off. Hold it up if you got it. All right, now wave it around, wave it around, yeah. Now go ahead and turn it around so the camera can see. There we go. So I think that open hardware for the individual is fun and educational, but open hardware together in a community is transformative and beautiful and artistic. And so this is a great little example of some of the kind of stuff that we do. We do social interventions out in the public, large scale. What I'm talking about is also known as placemaking. In reality, all places are made. They all have some kind of social construct already built into them. This term has also been bandied around quite a lot in the past 40 years or so, and it goes by many, many, many names. Uh, sometimes it gets a little bit confusing. What kind of intervention are you doing in the public space? But as all of us are makers, I think we can all agree that we like making things, we like sharing it, we like bringing it to the public. Placemaking also has the power to identify an entire space just based on a couple of key icons. On the count of three, what city is this right in here? One, two, three? Chicago. Right, Chicago. Everyone knows that. So one of the powers of public art is transformation. The place is known now as the home of the bean, or, you know, I think Clouds Rest, Cloud City. I don't even know the real name. It's just the bean. Now, this kind of public art had its heyday uh, a couple decades ago. We funded very large sculptures and structures, like the Eiffel Tower, more than a couple decades, I would say. But 
where was it, uh, Josh Pierce was saying that I think 10% of the scientists get their proposals funded. In the public art world, it's more like 0.2%. Uh, also going to established white-haired people who are already quite famous. So there's a big gap uh, in terms of individuals and small groups that have much smaller budgets and still big aspirations who want to make things. So this is Parking Day. Uh, parking Day happened yesterday in Philadelphia. Let's give another round of applause for fun things happening in town this weekend. If you're not familiar with it, Parking Day is where parking spots on the street are uh, guerrilla style taken over and imbued with temporary installations. Now, one thing that we get into as a group when we do our installations, this is one that happened over in Camden across the river last year, we run into the same couple of problems over and over again. We like to build big things, and it's really hard to make interventions into the public space on that scale, especially temporarily. This is called Blue Hour. It's a series of interactive light sculptures, about 20 feet tall. Here's a little gif of them in action. I'll let that play for a little bit. But we need a couple of essential items when we do installations like this. We need power, obviously. We need structure. There has to be something to hold up these physical bits. And what we would love to also have is internet. We're all makers of things. We know that the IoT is here. So let's get these built things out into the public and not just in our labs. This is another project we did recently in Las Vegas called Your Big Face, where we encouraged people to have their face digitally projected onto a giant polygon and make funny faces at passerby. Uh, one thing that we've learned from this work, doing it over and over again, is that people love to be creative. This is a generative construction project we did called Neodia 2, the magnetic planet, where people are encouraged to build little cities out of metallic bits and pieces. This is uh, the universal set, a giant dodecahedron that people can write on. And one thing we've seen, as you all know over and over again, People are creative if given the opportunity, right? If given a public canvas, people will write on it. If given a way to express themselves, they will do it. We want to shape our environment. This is what we want to do as makers and engineers and architects. Now, there's a term for this. It's the built environment, right? I hate that term. I think it should be called the building environment because built implies that it's done, right? It's like growing up. You don't ever have want to grown up. That means your changing is finished. You want to be always growing up. So there are a couple of projects out here that capitalize on this sort of desire to build and shape things. This is a great one by the uh, uh, Art and Technology Lab here, the, uh, the Free Art and Technology. And it's a universal construction kit so that as a school child you can uh, attach all of your favorite Tinker Toys and Legos and Kinects and all sorts of different hardware together. There's the universal set right there, free and open and downloadable for your 3D printer. But this is good for playing around on the attic floor or on a school table. It's not really good for city size scale. So just to make the analogy of the hardware that we're used to dealing with, this is another open source microcontroller, the Rascal, made by one of our co-founders, Brandon Stafford. And the Rascal, just like any other microcontroller, needs a couple of things. It needs power, it needs internet, and needs a structural attachment point so it's not just rattling around your case uh, and getting all banged about. If you've ever been to the airport, you know that sometimes utilities are hard to find. I think we've all had this experience when we're sitting and struggling to find a free laptop or phone charger plug. So out in the built environment, utilities are hard to come by, they're hard to change, there's limited access. Uh, and sometimes it's quite expensive. So in the city of Boston, putting one bolt in the sidewalk will cost you $5,000, and it will take months to do. This is a problem we recently faced with a local community group that wanted to do an installation temporarily. We needed to bolt it down. That involved uh, a meeting with the Public Improvement Committee, on which had to sit a licensed engineer, which costs a lot of money. We also had to advertise that meeting in the, po in the local paper, the Boston Globe, which costs a lot of money. So just even getting in the door in the public realm can be quite prohibitive for small budgets. So our solution that we are advocating as an open source solution, we're calling the art port, or the public art frameworks. It's stupid simple. Uh, it's just one of those things that hasn't happened yet and we really believe needs to happen. It's a structural attachment point basically a couple of J bolts set into concrete in a, recon in, a, in a set configuration of patterns. It is a waterproof enclosure housing electrical connections and a dedicated ethernet line. There's a little cross section of it so you can see the interior of the J bolts there. That's about uh, 1,200 pounds of concrete as an anchoring point. 
And when it's all buttoned up, it looks just like the sidewalk, flush mount, you never know it was there. So what this thing is, is a reusable, re-leverageable public art utility. Some things you could do with it are install a giant glass canopied tree in the middle of the plaza and not really have to worry about a base or any other additional supporting structure because that 1,200 pound block of concrete will suffice just fine. You could ready-made hook up your interactive electronic kiosk, which you can't see the uh, solar box because there isn't one. You can't see all the extension cords running beneath cord covers because they're buried underground. And this same exact port can be re-leverageable over and over and over again. Because like I said, the era of the large permanent public art piece is sort of behind us. All the organizations are about temporary, re-leverageable, changeable pop-up spaces. We also are going to think about a bigger size, maybe about 4,000 pounds of concrete down there, depending on the soil type, so you can do really fun things like this. These are just a couple examples. I know that all of you are much more creative than me, and so you can come up with some great ideas to have a test bed prototype out in the public that you can use. A little uh, headlight action at night, too. Now, once again, I want to remind you, this is mainly intended for small groups using to leverage uh, their resources to greater effect. It's not for giant public art installations, some of which like we have on the Ben Franklin Parkway. It's about changeability. It's about getting more people involved in shaping our built environment. We really believe that the more people build things actively out in the public, the more invested they are in the space, and the more stewardship there is for our public spaces. Right? We're all builders of things in the lab. Now we can be builders of things outside as well. Now I also work with the Workshop School, which is a uh, project-based high school in West Philadelphia. My workshop kid's still here? All right. Now, we're training an entire generation of 15 to 18 year olds to be makers. That's their entire curriculum in our school. Now, when they graduate, wouldn't it be great if each individual social organization that they're connected to has the capability of building really big, awesome, impressive, powerful things in the public for a very minimal cost? I think it would be. So who's it good for? It's good for the event planners who are programming spaces that need to change continuously. Uh, it's good for people who do the actual construction to have a modular kit that's the same every time. Uh, it's good for cities themselves because, you know, it kind of builds that cred as developing a public place, as a th place where things happen, where art and creativity happens. It's great for sociologists who want to study the data that are generated by interactive sculptures. Don't have enough time to talk about all the data we generate, but part of the perks of having interactive art, it always generates a record when it's used and how it's used. So these data are quite interesting on a sociological level. Uh, it's great for content creators like everyone in this room, for people who want to express their creativity on a grander scale. We started out pretty small too, and through leveraging projects that were already built and hacking them in interactive ways, we started to get into that bigger and bigger arena. And we just want everyone else to be able to do the same thing easily. So I just want to remind you once again, the Arduino, great open hardware platform for small things. The open hardware that I want is a bolt in the sidewalk that doesn't cost an arm and a leg and months of planning to go through. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank uh, my fellow... Thank you. I want to thank my fellow co-founders at New American Public Art and all of the great organizations that let us play around with going through painful permitting processes. I uh, also want to give a shout out to the maker spaces we're involved with, especially a couple right here in Philadelphia, the Philly Sculpture Gym and NextFab Studio. Uh, Mike over here is going to be giving a tour later of NextFab down in South Philly. If you're curious about a local maker space, I definitely recommend checking it out. So thanks again. Tomorrow, tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow for the tour. Thanks again, everybody. Okay, before we break for coffee, I want to just call the speakers from the next block up to talk to Max and Zach to check your slides. Uh, Benedetta, Bruce Boys, Tiga and Surya, Pedro and um, his partner, Tom Igo, and that's it. So there'll be food uh, downstairs. Don't forget to get your picture taken. And let's give another round of applause for all the speakers from this session. Thank you.